Well, Shabbat Shalom. Here we are back on this series, Christians Must Obey the Law. Last Sabbath sermon regarding the Maseroth, and more particularly that eclipse that will be happening on April the 8th, generated a lot of interest. And maybe some of you did some further research on that. I'm sure we will be talking about that more in the future. But you know, actually, that is linked. It is actually linked to this topic of obeying the law. You know, to obey Yahweh's law is part of coming out of Babylon. That's part of that. The Babylonian system is command in Scripture. It says in Revelation chapter 18, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, and that you do not receive of her plagues. You know, we will be addressing this aspect of leaving Babylon and how that has influenced, terribly influenced, current religion and Christianity. Uh, we'll address that at a later point. You know, there's so much depth to this topic of obeying the law. I'm very, very gratified that Yahweh has given us direction to go this way. Um, we're going to start off with this statement that I'm going to show you. I believe it's very important. The words of Yeshua must be your baseline and foundation for understanding much New Testament Scripture. You must go back to his words, Yahshua's words, in order to have a better understanding of his apostles' words, particularly Paul's words. Why? Well, I think you know the answer to that, really. You know, the, the words of Yeshua's apostles have been greatly misconstrued and distorted. Protestants and Roman Catholics have elevated their distortions particularly of the Apostle Paul's words, in order to make up a separate gospel for Gentile Christians. There's not one indication in the Bible from Yahshua's mouth or the Father's mouth that Gentile Christians have a separate, a different plan of salvation. That idea only comes by twisting and perverting some of Paul's writings. The Apostle Peter even gives a warning that Paul's writings would be distorted in 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says there, Peter says, Consider the long-suffering of our Master to be salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things about which some are some things are hard to understand. We know that there are some things hard to understand in Paul's writings. Which the untaught and the unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures, to their own destruction. It's a warning that Peter is giving. So the bottom line... You know, when, when you read something in the Scripture, particularly, let's say, Paul's writings, you know, Paul was, he's considered one of the five smartest men that's ever lived. One of the five most intelligent men that's ever lived. A lot of times, a person that uh, is very intelligent, um, they may speak in language that is a little higher than our language, so to speak. And they may speak the same if they speak English or if they speak Greek or whatever. It, the words are understandable, but putting sense to the words sometimes is a little difficult, you know, for us commoners. <laughs> and uh, the Apostle Paul's writings, when you, when you see something in the Apostle Paul's writings that appear to, to be different, speaks about sometimes he uses the terminology, my gospel. Well, that would give you the impression that he has his own gospel. That's not the case. He's talking about he's giving out the gospel. He's personalizing it. It's not that it's personally his gospel, but he is the one giving it out. So when we see something in Scripture that gives the impression that there's a different method of salvation, whoa, Nelly, go slow. 
back up. Go back to the words of Yahshua. The law has not gone away. And that's what Protestantism and Roman Catholicism say. The law is null and void, and it's not. In fact, it says in Malachi 3.6, For I am Yahweh, I change not. He hasn't changed it at all. And we must remember, remember that. So we're talking about Christians must keep the law. You know, Satan is doing everything that he can to subvert Yahweh's word. He's been doing it from day one. He did it in the Garden of Eden with Eve. And we read in the scripture about his representative, the Antichrist. And he will be doing even more to subvert Yahweh's word. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, Then the lawless one will be revealed whom Yahshua will sweep away with the tempest of his anger and utterly overwhelmed by the awful splendor of his coming. The appearing of the lawless one will be attended by various miracles and tokens and delusive marvels. For so Satan works. And by every kind of wicked deception for those who are on the way to perdition because they did not welcome into their hearts the love of the truth, so that they might be saved. Those people that take the mark of the beast can never be saved. That's why you and I must warn people about what is coming. There are going to be many Christians that are deceived. We'll look into that in a little bit. One of the primary ways that the Antichrist is defined is by this title here that you see highlighted, the lawless one. Yahweh's enemy, our enemy, our adversary, Satan, and the soon coming Antichrist. The Antichrist is already here somewhere. Some people think they have identified who it is. I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Probably maybe. <laughs> But anyway, he hates everything about Yahweh's law. That's his nature. He rejects every aspect of Yahweh's law. There's not one thing that he accepts of Yahweh's law. He hates Yahweh, he hates his law, and he hates Yahweh's people. He hates all of mankind, actually. Well, we expect him to do that. But you know, the problem is that there are Christians that he wants to deceive. He wants to deceive you. He wants to deceive me. And there's so many things that are available to us that can cause deception, be a tool of deception in our lives. The great deception that is talked about in the scripture, we'll go to that in a little bit. Paul and Yeshua both talk about it. Yeshua says in Matthew chapter 24, for false Christs and false prophets will be raised up. And they will give great signs and wonders, so as to, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. And we need to think about that and ponder on that. Because if it is such a great lie that even the elect could be deceived, then all Christians are susceptible to deception. We are not immune from deception. If you say that a Christian is immune from deception, then you answer me this. Why, why is it that there are, when I was taking uh, Baptist history in college, why were there at that time 56 different Baptist denominations? And every one of them says, we're right. And you mentioned a while ago about the Church of Christ, and they say, we're right. And the landmark Baptists say, we're right. And the Roman Catholics say, we're the only church in the world. Someone's wrong. Someone's been deceived. So we need to understand that all Christians are susceptible. You know, the book of Daniel records the activity of the Antichrist also and what's going to be happening in the upcoming Great Tribulation. Daniel refers to the Antichrist as a little horn in Daniel chapter 8. Look what he says. And the host was given unto it, talking about the little horn, the Antichrist, I'll repeat, and the host was given to it together with the daily sacrifice because of transgression, and it cast the truth to the ground, 
and it practiced and prospered. So the Antichrist is going to degrade Yahweh's law, Yahweh's truth. And hasn't he already done that? Hasn't that already been done by Satan? They've called Yahweh's law antiquated. Oh, it's oppressive. If you obey the law, it, it's oppressive. You need to be freed from that. Now, well, that's the modus operandi of the devil himself. And as you look at what the Apostle Paul was talking about, the work of the Antichrist, who is actually Satan, his whole goal is to convince people to do away with the law. Be aware of the words of Andy Stanley. Do you remember Andy Stanley, the son of Charles Stanley, Baptist Bible teacher? Look what he said. Andy Stanley has stated that Christians need to, quote, unhitch the Old Testament from their faith. And he went on to say, quote, this direct quote from Andy Stanley, Peter, James, and Paul elected to unhitch the Christian faith from their Jewish scriptures, and my friends, we must as well. Now, folks, that's an out-and-out -out lie. So looking at Yahshua's statement that the deceptions can even happen to the elect, and it's been happening because truth has been cast to the ground. Andy Stanley's statement there has cast tr the truth to the ground. There are over 300 references in the New Testament to the Old Testament. Direct quotes. Over 300. How in the world can anyone unhitch from the Old Testament? Cannot happen. Is it any wonder why today we find most of Protestantism holding on to this teaching of the Antichrist, that the law is antiquated, it's been done away with, it's null and void? It's hard to fathom. But they believe that Yeshua, our Master, our Messiah, actually did away with His own law and destroyed it. And how, how foolish, how utterly foolish. There are other descriptions, descriptive words I could use, but I'll, I'll stick with that one. According to most Protestant pastors and Bible teachers, if you're a good Christian, then you will put the law away and you'll move forward in grace. That, my friends, is a great lie. It's a great deception. You know, the writer of Hebrews says something that's very pertinent about Yeshua in the first chapter. He starts out by quoting various scriptures from the Old Testament, and then he comes in, uh, uh, I believe it's in verse 8, starting in verse 8, and he quotes Psalm 45. Here's, and here's Psalm 45, and by the way, you know, that's casting truth to the ground. Psalm 45, your throne, it says, O Elohim, is forever and ever. A scepter of justice is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate iniquity. Therefore, Elohim, your Elohim, has appointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. Now, this is the Father talking about the Son. Okay, to give you some background on this. This is the Father talking about the Son. And uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, here's what the quotation says. But unto the Son, he saith, see the Son, unto your throne, O Elohim. Unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, Elohim, even thy Elohim, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So you see that the word wickedness has been changed by the author of Hebrews to lawlessness. You hate lawlessness. Yahweh hates lawlessness. Yeshua hates lawlessness. So has the law been declared null and void? How foolish. Is it any wonder why we read those terrifying words of Yeshua in Matthew chapter 7, when those Christians will be coming before him and pleading their case 
about why they should be allowed into the kingdom to rule and reign with Christ and to receive eternal life. We've looked at this before, and we will probably look at it again down the road. Matthew chapter 7, Yeshua says, Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, will go into the kingdom of the heavens. But he who does the will of my Father who is in the heavens. Many will say to me in that day, Master, Master, can't you imagine them pleading, crying? Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name and, and cast out demons in your name, perform many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, just like that title slide that you saw, the Bible does not say, depart from me, you who practice the law. The Bible says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's a critical, critical thing for you and I to remember and to be able to use that in our repertoire of weapons when we talk to someone. These people that are going to be standing before Yeshua, pleading to be allowed to receive eternal life, to reign in the kingdom, and yet while they were living, they had received Yeshua as their Savior. Understand that. They had received Yeshua as their Savior. They'd been baptized, probably. Many of them had. They'd be received the first fruits of the Holy Spirit. They'd been faithful in church. They had done many wonderful things in the name of Yeshua, but they had neglected to obey the least commandment. Actually, they had been taught to disobey that one particular commandment. We know which one it was, the Sabbath commandment. And because of that, Yeshua will be stating to them, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. But you know, and we'll get to this verse in just a moment here, Okay. They will be in the kingdom because they have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says in the scripture, He will never leave us or forsake us. Never means never. And praise Yahweh for that. They will be in the kingdom, but they will not initially be receiving eternal life and they will not be ruling and reigning with Yeshua because they've been disobedient to that. Just one commandment, that's all it takes, folks. It says in the book of James, if you disobey one, you've disobeyed them all. We have to remember that. This is not cruelty. This is cause and effect. It's a matter of obedience and disobedience. So they will be in the kingdom, but they will not be ruling with Christ. It says here, Yahshua's statement, as you see on the screen, Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now you may say, well, I don't obey the Sabbath commandment, but I don't teach people to do it, so therefore, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> don't go there. If you disobey it, you're guilty of teaching others. Because your life is a, it's a lesson book. You are teaching others with your actions. These lawbreakers will be allowed to enter into the kingdom, but they will not receive eternal life, and they will not be permitted to rule and reign with Christ. They will be among the least, but because they do have the Holy Spirit, who never leaves us or forsakes us, and they will become commandment keepers in the kingdom. Everyone in the world will be a commandment keeper in the kingdom. Those that rule and reign with Christ will be ruling with a rod of iron. That doesn't mean you're going to be carrying a stick around in your hands, you know, okay? A steel stick or an iron stick. It doesn't mean that, of course. It just means that there's no ifs, ands, buts about it. Yahweh's law will be applied worldwide. In fact, it says, I don't have it up here for uh, you to look at it on the screen. We've looked at it previously. But it says in the book of Zechariah, it says those nations around the world, if they don't send 
representatives during the Feast of Tabernacles to Jerusalem, their nation will not get any rain. You know, it's either Yahweh's way or the highway, so to speak. There's no ifs, ands, but. There's no runs, drips, and errors. You either do what Yahweh says or suffer the consequences. You know, I said that that was the least commandment. The Sabbath commandment is not the least. The only reason we use that terminology is because Protestantism is, that's the one commandment that Protestantism has majored on to disobey. That's the one commandment that they say is not necessary to obey. You obey the rest of the other commandments, but not that Sabbath commandment. You've been freed from that. Well, let me ask, what's free about not worshiping on the Sabbath? We're obeying the Yahshua. You know, it's, it's interesting. People call themselves Christians, and a Christian is supposed to be a person that follows Christ. And yet, most Christians don't follow Christ because they don't do what he did. And here we are trying to do what he did, and we're the ones that get persecuted. <laughs> Isn't that the case? We get persecuted. We get mocked. We get yelled at because we are trying to obey the Sabbath commandment, just like our master Yeshua did. That's interesting, is it not? What about the Sabbath? Well, look at it. It's a sign according to Ezekiel chapter 20. Yahweh says here, And I gave them my statutes and showed them my ordinances, which, if a man do, he shall even live. And I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, me and them, that they might know that I'm Yahweh who sanctifies them. The reason we obey that is because we want to know that we are his children and he sanctifies us. But the house of Israel, going on, but the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes and they despised my ordinances, which if a man does, he shall even live in them. And they greatly polluted my Sabbaths. And I said, I will pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to destroy them. Why do I preach on the Sabbath? Folks, I'm not going to alter that. If you think I'm going to alter that or water that down, you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> that is not going to happen. Yahweh revealed this to me back in 2012, and I realized how much in error I had been previous to that. And I, just like the song that we sing frequently, I have decided to follow Yeshua. No turning back. And though no one join me, still I will follow. No turning back. <clears throat> you know, Rachel Baxter, the lady that I quoted last week and got some information regarding the uh, alignment of the planets and so on, she's received many visions from Yahweh. She's written a wonderful book <laughs> called The Revelation of Israel, God's Plan is Our Destiny. And here was, here's what she says in part of the book. The choice will be ours, just as it was with those Israelites who chose to leave Egypt to follow Moses into the wilderness first and then follow Joshua into the promised land. Will we choose to come out of bondage in the nations to which we, as his children, are scattered when he calls us? Will we choose to lay down every false identity we've given ourselves to claim our inheritance as members of the 12 tribes of Israel? Will we choose to follow God's ways, forsaking our own? This is what it will take to be counted as one of the regathered of Israel. This is God's plan and our destiny. Aren't those wonderful words? They're absolutely true. Mainstream Christianity has embraced the world's culture, specifically the culture to worship Yahweh on another day than what he designated. He's only designated one day. 
and that is a Sabbath day. There's a ministry called Ligonier Ministry. I've occasionally seen it on the internet, various things. They are a, uh, a Protestant denomination. They are, uh, I think, is reform, what they call reform theology. Here's what they say. While we worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. Whoa, let's just stop right there. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? Oh, let's go on. Read it again. While we worship Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath, on the first day of the week, in commemoration of His resurrection glory, we eagerly await the full revelation of the one who secured Sabbath rest for us by his death and resurrection. <laughs> That's a sad statement right there. See, as we know, that first day of the week celebration or commemoration, that's a man-made commemoration. You know, the Yahshua, when He was here on the earth walking, He specifically, He laid into the Pharisees time and time and time again. The Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees, you know, the elites of Judaism, because... Their religion was man-made. Their viewpoint, their rules, and their dogmas were man-made. They were not by, done by Yahweh. They added to the law. They took away from the law. It was all man-made. And that's what he laid in, in, into them about. And they'd been teaching that. It had been going on for hundreds of years, folks. Hundreds of years when Yahshua came on the scene. And what has been going on in Protestantism here for hundreds of years? Man-made tradition. The same type of thing. Exactly. The same type of thing. You know, we are fully aware that... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we are fully aware that the Roman Emperor Constantine mandated that the day of Sabbath worship would cease and Sunday would be substituted in its place. So both Roman Catholicism and Protestantism have cast the truth to the ground regarding Yahweh's law. And you know, there are many other aspects of the world's culture that each one of us are going to have to leave in order to come out of her, my people, are we not? I'm sure that Yahweh is going to show each one of us personally various things in our own lives that we need to put aside in order to come out of her. This is one of the key things, though. It says in Revelation 18, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, talking about Babylon, Come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, that you do not receive of her plagues. You know, the entire world is under the jurisdiction of Satan. He deceived Eve back in the Garden of Eden. And then when Adam, Adam wasn't deceived. Adam deliberately chose to take that fruit. And that's why this entire world has now been switched over to the jurisdiction of Satan. Now, Yahweh is over all. He is over all. But this is a temporary thing, thankfully it's temporary. But Satan is the one that is a prince of the power of the air. And he has jurisdiction over this world. He has jurisdiction over every, every institution in this world. And we must not forget that. And he is deceptive above all. Deception and lying are his modus operandi. You know, last week we briefly looked at Revelation chapter 12, the sign that happened in the heavens back on September the 23rd of 2017. Well, it says later on in that same chapter, the great dragon was cast out, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast down with him. So not only can he deceive, he has deceived the whole world. 
we're talking about that same kind of deception that Yeshua talks about in Matthew chapter 24. If it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. This deception is, has a, it's already captured many Christians. We already know that many Christians have fallen into deception, thinking that they could walk lawlessly. They've been taught. They've been taught. I was taught to walk lawlessly. Now, we weren't taught the phrase, now you must walk lawlessly. No, I don't mean that. It's just that we were taught that worshiping on the first day of the week instead of obeying Yahweh and worshiping on the Sabbath. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to honor His resurrection, aren't you? And we were taught that. And we bought into it hook, line, and sinker, did we not? Many of us did. And many people that are going to be watching this video have done the same. And yet Yahweh is very, very clear in His Word that the Sabbath day is the only day that He's designated for worship. Now, can you worship Him on any day of the week? Of course you can. But you also have to designate the Sabbath day as the primary day of worship. We must remember that. You know, at the judgment seat of, of Yeshua, these people that have been walking lawlessly are sadly, very sadly, going to find out that they've been deceived by the serpent, by Satan. And maybe their pastor, maybe their Bible teacher was the one that was speaking the words, but Satan was the one behind it. And they bought into a deception. Notice the Apostle Paul's words, what he says here in 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> and brothers, we entreat you by the coming of our Master Yeshua Messiah and of our gathering together to Him, that you not let your mind be hastily excited or troubled, neither by word, nor by spirit, nor by prophecy of the Spirit, nor by an epistle, supposedly coming from us, stating that the day of our Master is at hand. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, because that day will not come, unless first there comes a great rebellion, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. It says here, the great falling away. Well, when Paul wrote this epistle, he wrote these words, there were evidently some people that had been telling the people at Thessalonica, the assembly there at Thessalonica, telling them that Yeshua had either come or he was going to come, they were going to be left out. In other words, they were fearful. A lot of them were fearful. So he's writing these words to calm them down. And he says that two things have to happen before Yeshua returns. First of all, a great rebellion among Yahweh's people had to happen. And rebellion is a defection from truth. And then secondly, the Antichrist has to be revealed. Well, think about it. Has not a great rebe rebellion already happened? Absolutely. What has mainstream Christianity done? They have defected from the truth. Mainstream Christianity, they've already fallen away from the truth. Now that verse that we just read, it may also mean that there's going to be an additional falling away of some kind. I can't tell you for certain, but I can say with certainty that a falling away definitely has already happened. They've rebelled from the truth and fallen away. And we are in the last days, my friends. We know that. The Antichrist will very soon be revealed. He's here somewhere. And the sign in the heavens that's coming on, April the 8th, is a warning to all of Yahweh's people. The alignment of those seven planets and the sun and the moon is an added sign. And that comet called the Devil's Comet, that will be visible. You'll only be able to see it when the eclipse actually happens here. So you will have four minutes to look and somewhere near where the sun is. Make sure you have glasses on. Don't look at it without glasses. Uh, the right kind of glasses. I'm not talking about these kind of glasses, but a special you know, dark glass. And uh, you, you should be able to see that. But make no mistake about it. These are very severe warnings from Yahweh. It's not just something that people should be treating. Oh, that's cool. Look at that. Oh, well, no, don't look at it. But 
No, we don't want to treat it like it's cool. No, it's a warning, folks. It's a very severe warning. It's a warning to our brothers and sisters that are enmeshed and immersed in Protestantism and perhaps Roman Catholicism or even pagans. The mainstream church has fallen away. It is preaching nothing more than a Babylonian gospel. It's a worldly gospel, a partial gospel. And if you continue to believe that gospel, you will be denied the privilege of receiving eternal life and the privilege of ruling and reigning with Yahshua. Twelve years ago, Yahweh opened my eyes, and I left that aspect of the Babylonian system behind. I have many brothers, many Christian brothers and sisters that are in that system. And I pray that their eyes will be opened like Yahweh opened my eyes. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, I pray that the Elohim of our Master Yeshua, the Messiah, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to us who believe according to the working of His mighty power which He wrought in the Messiah when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power, might, dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Wonderful words, are they not? We need to pray that for those that we know are still immersed in that Babylonian system. So be a Berean. If you ask Yahweh to open your spiritual eyes when you read the Scriptures, you will see these things are true. So until next Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom.